Thanks so much for great testimonies. It's just such a joy to be a part of a church that is concerned about the lost and think about it. None of us could do this on our own, but together um, we, can, we can reach the nations, and that's such a blessing and encouragement. So God go with you guys. I think I showed this cartoon maybe a couple of years ago in the evening, and it's a guy there stopped, and he's saying, my wife insisted I stop and ask someone for directions. Could you just pretend you're giving them to me? So not only do we live in a self-sufficient culture where we're afraid to ask for help, we also live in a culture that hates waiting. I don't know anyone who loves queues, who just thrives off traffic, who loves slow internet and says, great, you know, my packages were delayed. Cool, not at all. Um, A professor of communication writes, we live in one of the most individualistic cultures in the world, which means we want what we want, And we want it now, and it better be quick and easy. Do I hear an amen? (laughs) I think one of the casualties of living in such a self-sufficient, I can't wait age, is the casualty of our prayer lives. Um, Just look at your prayer life, and when you think about it, prayer at its core is asking God for help, and in its second core is really waiting upon the Lord for that answer to come, the two things (laughs) that we actually hate. So that's perhaps why prayer has taken a back seat and we find it so difficult in our day and age. So we're coming to our fourth message in our series called Parable Stories That Read Us, and we're going to look at two parables this morning. So it's two for the price of one, which probably means my sermon's going to be double the normal length, because we're going to pack two sermons into it. Uh, two parables about prayer that are going to expose two hindrances to our prayer lives, and I think you'll see the links with what we've said. So turn with me to parable number one, a parable that's called The Friend at Midnight. It's on page 68, page 68, Luke chapter 11, verses 5 to 13. So if you glance at the context around this passage, which we're not going to unpack, I'm just going to hone in on the parable. At the beginning of Luke chapter 11, the disciples have just asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. They've seen him praying, and and, and if he's God and he needs to pray, then surely we do. And they say, Lord, teach us how to pray. And one of the things he tells them to pray is give us each day our daily bread. And we're going to see this theme of bread um, coming through. And Jesus then reinforces this teaching with a parable. We said on our first week, a parable is, it means to throw alongside. So Jesus has given us the teaching, and now he's going to throw this parable alongside. So let's read it together. Luke 11 from verse 5. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I've nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, "Uh, Don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though (coughs) though he will not get up and give him the bread, Because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Now Jesus begins in verse 5 with a kind of a a Greek construction that doesn't really come through in the English, but Jesus is kind of saying, can you imagine this scenario? Can you picture this? Uh, Could you ever imagine this taking place? And the hearers who are listening, the answer that's expected is no. This is an impossible situation. Uh, We won't ever see this. The hearers would have even picked up some of the humor in what Jesus was saying. This would never have happened because hospitality in this day and age and culture, uh, which was a shame-pride culture, it would have brought shame upon you to not show hospitality. This hospitality was essential. and So nobody's expecting uh, the man in the story not to get up. So here's the scenario. The host in the story, he has a, a midnight emergency. A friend of his arrives unexpectedly very, very late at night, far later than any guest of the day would have arrived. And I think that's part of the exaggeration in the story. Jesus is saying he came at midnight. Sunset was around 6 p.m. And without electricity, as we looked at the 10 virgins last week, we see here as well, midnight is incredibly late. And so no no normal guest would have arrived this late. So so that's, that's kind of the extremeness of this parable. And the guest is probably tired. He's probably very hungry. And so his host goes to the fridge and opens it, and if you, his kids have chowed all the leftover pizza, there's nothing left, and I just got new groceries yesterday, it's all gone. Uh, thankfully, I've got girls, they don't eat as much as those of you that have boys, so I'm told. But uh, he realizes he's got nothing to offer his guest. 
And so what is he going to do? This is going to bring shame upon him personally. In fact, the village has a responsibility as well because a guest of an individual is also the guest of that village and that culture and would bring shame upon them. And we know there was no engine quick shop, no Uber Eats, no uh, frozen microwave dinners and microwaves to warm them up. And so his only solution is to go to his neighbor and to borrow some bread. So he goes to his neighbor at midnight and this is what he says. Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. And then he explains the story. And perhaps he hopes that if he starts the sentence with friend, it might kind of lessen any bit of anger of, I don't know about you, if you fast asleep and someone just says, friend, I don't think there's any word you can say that's going to make it go easy after that. But Jesus then continues the scenario and says, can you imagine, can you just picture someone inside the house answering, don't bother me, the door's already locked, my children are with me in bed, I can't get up and give you anything, the alarm is already on, the beams outside are activated, the, the children are sleeping, the, the dog is snoring, there's Lego pieces lying all over the floor, I'm barefoot, there's load shedding, I'm going to injure myself, go away, leave me alone. Such a response would have been unthinkable and even humorous. Many homes in those times were one-bedroom homes and they had a raised platform and the family all slept together in one bed. And then on the side towards the door, the lower level, that's where all the cattle and the sheep and the goats and whatever else was in the house. So just imagine this late hour dilemma. How's this guy gonna get up, not disturb his wife, his children? He's gonna walk past the chickens and the donkeys and who knows what else is there. He's gonna remove that heavy beam from the door, not make a noise and disturb anyone. It almost seems impossible. Now think about it, the man who's at the door requesting bread knows this. He's not a fool. He knows what time it is. You know? It's not like that that, that one comedy I saw where the guy didn't have his watch and so he shouts to his neighbor, oi, oi, and then the neighbor says, do you know what time it is? No, I don't. It's 3 a.m., thank you. (laughs) That's not what's going on here. He knows. He still boldly asks for the three loaves when he knows the implications of it. And and when we read that, maybe you're thinking, yo, what kind of massive guest has come that he wants to eat three loaves of bread? I mean, talk about carb loading, you know? But in Eastern culture, hospitality is shown by how much food is left over, not how much food is eaten. In that culture, you you can't offer just the leftover scraps of bread. You you have to offer a a new loaf. Maybe they were a small, maybe there were three rolls, something like that. And bread in those days was, was not just the, the thing that you ate. Bread was the plate. Bread was also the utensil that you broke off and, and, and you used it. So, so in some sense, I like to think that this host was asking for more than bread. Maybe he was hinting, uh, you know, I, I actually don't just need bread, the utensils. I actually need main course as well, which I don't have. And perhaps if you've got a little bit of dessert, maybe something from Woolies would be, would be quite nice. And we see what happens because I think there's a hint of that in verse eight. Jesus says, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he'll get up and look what it says, and give him as much as he needs, maybe even whatever he needs. I'm already up, what is it? And there's there's even a picture of something of abundance here. Now the word boldness is a difficult word to interpret and it's caused much confusion. And part of dealing with the parables is they're incredibly hard and maybe we're not always aware, even certainly me, as I come to a parable, I think this one seemed easy and then it's tough. And I don't always wanna bring you into the kitchen and show you all the stuff that's gone on behind the scenes and the lead up to this in the kitchen. I just wanna come out and kind of serve you the meal. But there is a sense that if you were to come into the kitchen, this word boldness or shamelessness is a, is a difficult word. Is it a positive word? Is it a negative word? It's hard to tell in the Greek. Does the word actually refer to the guy that's at the door or the guy that's sleeping? And depending on which one, uh, there's, there's different interpretations. But I just want to serve you the fact that I believe the best translation, in my opinion, is the NIV 2011 edition. You've got the 1984 edition in your pews. But the 2011 edition reads, I tell you, Even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity. Shameless audacity, he'll surely get up and give you as much as you need. And so I want you to understand that this parable is not actually about persistence in prayer. I've heard many sermons and many commentaries say, oh, this is about persistence in prayer, but I don't see it here. The man only asks once. Did you notice that? He doesn't knock repeatedly, 
I've heard sermons that say he was just knocking and knocking and the guy was refusing and saying no and said kept knocking. No, there's no mention that he knocked at all. Where's that in the parable? There's no mention that he keeps calling out to his friend. He calls out once. Uh, in that culture, a stranger would be the one that knocked, but a friend would call out. They'd go to your house and just call you by name, as, as what happens in some cultures. Craig Blomberg, in his book, Interpreting the Parable, says, the man must ask boldly and without shame. Without shame. He's got to put his shame aside of what this is going to do to the family. He's got to ask. Blomberg says that the Yiddish word chutzpah, is a good word to describe this. In other words, the man has the audacity, the cheek, the nerve, maybe even the word the moxie. It's like, uh, I don't know, it's that word moxie. To disturb his friend at midnight, there's something of a courage without fear and a kind of a legitimate stubbornness. And what Jesus is doing is he's exposing now, these parables read us, he's exposing our prayer life with a contrast. And remember the shrewd manager? We, we saw this evil guy and then he's commended, but it's a parable of contrast. If an evil guy can act that way, then how much more? And so this is also a how much more parable. Look down to verse 11 and following, which, we don't, which we're not going to unpack this morning, but this makes this point clear. This is a how much more parable. Luke 11, verse 11. Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? I mean, even me who's a prankster, has played lots of pranks on my girls, I'm not sure I would do that. Dad, please, can we have a fish? They don't even eat fish, so they would never ask me that. But, and then give them a snake instead. I believe that there was a kind of a snake in the Sea of Galilee that, that kind of was a fish, so it looked like a, a, a fish. No, we wouldn't. And if you ask for an egg, you know, here you go, and this egg suddenly unravels, and oh my word, it's a scorpion. And so Jesus says, if you then, though you're evil, though you're sinful, Though your parents, you know how to give good gifts to your your children. So he says, so then how much more? How much more will your father in heaven, who is good, who is not evil, who is not sinful, who doesn't have the wrong motives. So this parable is saying, if in our human relationships, a grumpy, snoring friend would be willing to get up at midnight, risk disturbing his whole family, because of a friend's shameless audacity, then how much more will God answer our prayers? A God who neither slumbers nor sleeps, who is always awake, who is always alert, who always loves for you to come and to approach him. How much more? Surely God is never disturbed by his children. And surely God will give us immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. Is that what Ephesians 3 and verse 20 says? That now that in some sense we've roused God, not that we do, but he gives us more than what we need. This parable exposes our self-sufficiency. It exposes our timid fears in failing to ask God for help in prayer. Think of situations you're facing right now and we're going to fix it mode. I'm gonna, what about just pausing and saying, Lord, I wanna bring this to you first. What stops you from coming to God with a shameless audacity, with a risk-taking boldness? What kind of risk-taking prayers could you be praying that you're not praying because you're afraid to pray them because what if God answered them? James chapter four and verse two says, you do not have because you do not ask God. Just think of the simple truth. You do not have because you do not ask God. The starting point is how can you hope to have what you need if you don't ask? And I think sometimes even our theology, if we emphasize one aspect of God's character of another or faults in our theology can, can stop us from praying. We say, oh, God is sovereign. You know, I've looked out. I don't want to disturb God. It seems to me like the door is closed. Who am I to interrupt God's sovereignty? The door is closed. God is asleep in bed. I don't want to disturb heaven. What right do I have approached? Little old me, God is great. He's running the universe. He's out there. He's large. He's big. Will my prayer make a difference? What if God's already made up his mind? What if it seems too late? The situation's too far gone. It's, it's midnight. I can't come to God at this late hour. What will he think? Maybe I'll just wait for a better time or I won't come at all. And I want to say no believer. Bring bold and fervent prayers any time of the day, any time of the night. Bring risk-taking prayers that will wake up the neighborhood of heaven. 
How many prayers are waiting to be answered but have not been answered because you haven't prayed? How many lost people have not been won to faith because you haven't prayed? What countries are waiting for revival and you, not, you have not prayed? How many needs unmet? Is it fear? Is it pride? Is bold praying beneath you say, oh, that's a bit embarrassing. I'm embarrassed to come. I've got shame. I don't want to disturb things. Or are you worried that the answer might be no? and ruin the friendship, and so you don't bother coming at all. That's, I've even had those twisted motives. Uh, I remember when, when we weren't sure if Liesl and I were, were gonna be able to have children many, many years ago because some rare genetic disease had been found in her family, and so I, I remember wrestling and thinking, Lord, I really want kids, but what if I come to you and pray and the answer is no, and then I'm disappointed with you, so maybe it's better not to pray. It's so convoluted. It's like those years when Liesl and I were close friends and I didn't want to risk relationally and ask her out on a date because I thought, what if it ruins the friendship? Stupid, foolish, timid Justin and I had these strong friends. Hey, I got another girl's number on the ice rink last weekend and it's like, oh, what a idea, I'm so awkward. <laughs> but how much I missed out by not asking her out, by not taking a risk and coming to God in prayer. Because by not coming, you're saying, God is not a friend. If that guy hadn't come, he would have said, oh, he's not actually a neighbor, he's not really my friend. It was the basis. He could come because he was his friend. That's why he could take a risk because he knew in that culture the friend would respond. And God's not just a friend, he's a father. You're being self-sufficient when you don't recognize your need for bread. Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. Relationship lies at the heart of this parable and we don't have time to unpack just how relationship fits hand in hand with prayer because it's more than just God give me what I want. It's about coming to enjoy his friendship. And I wanna say as a child of God, you have access. The writer to the Hebrews says this to every true believer. Hebrews 4, 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with what? Timidity, hiding away, Shame, no, with confidence. How dare you and I approach the throne of grace with confidence? The only reason is because Christ has ripped the curtain open. We can enter in to the holy place. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We have this great privilege. We have access, Romans 5 says to the Father, and yet we choose not to come. Craig Blomberg says, there are good things which God desires his people to have, but which he has determined to give them only if they earnestly seek him in prayer. There is a mystery in that, that God in his sovereignty has ordained that there are some things that he will only give you if you pray. I don't fully understand that, and I don't know what those things are, so therefore I come with boldness and I pray. You are a child of the king and you can come boldly. Jesus has removed your shame at the cross. That's why you can come with shameless audacity. Perfect love drives out fear. We don't pick it at the throne of grace. We don't toy toy at the throne of grace saying, come I need a hearing, service delivery. No, we are his children. We can walk right in, we can catch the elevator up to the penthouse CEO's office, walk in and go behind the desk and sit on our dad's lap and we do not ever disturb him because he is our father. Full rights as sons. I've shared this story with you before but it's, it's, it's just a personal story that moves me about my gran that I used to call Gaga. It's very close to her and she was 96 years old and she still felt that God would never accept her and we'd had some wonderful times where I'd had opportunities to share with her about the Lord and, and she just felt God wouldn't accept her and she was quite closed about a relationship with God and kind of just kept him at arm's length. And you might remember, just before I started here at Rosebank Union, Liesl and I and the family, we broke down in the middle of the Karoo coming up for, for, from Cape Town after a holiday. Engine blown, not sure what to do. And my gran prayed a bold, risk-taking prayer. Not even sure that God would answer, and this is what she said as we were stuck there. She said, God, I'm only gonna ask you this once. Please, will you send a friend into Justin and Liesl's life to rescue them? And I took a phone call out on the pavement outside the Beaufort West Hotel on the N1, and at that exact moment, friends of ours were driving past, 
She said, oh, there's Justin. He was high up at McCarthy Motors, sorted everything out. We got back to Joburg. It's a long story. But when I spoke to my gran on the phone later that day, she was in tears. She was humbled that God would answer her prayer. And when I said to her, Gaga, what, what time did you pray that prayer? She said, well, you know, I've got that big red bedside alarm clock and it was around about 9.30 and I went to my call log on my phone and I received this call at 9.32. And when I told her that she broke down and wept and why would God, why would God answer my prayer? And his, his love for her as a father that, that she wasn't even acknowledging up until that point, I believe was the turning point in her life because four or five months later she passed away and I believe she knew the Lord through that event. Her shameless audacity knowing that God owed her nothing and just asking once like this man. It melted her heart. Uh, before that, she thought, well, God is not my friend. He won't listen. And after he showed her his friendship, it changed her relationship. But what happens if you have prayed boldly and the answer hasn't come? Remember, God can say yes, he can say no, but he can also say wait. So what happens if you've come with shameless audacity and God seems to have said nothing? It's as though your prayers haven't gone past the ceiling. Well, that's why Jesus teaches parable number two. For when God delays in answering our cry for help, and that's why I wanted to put these two together. Parable number two is the unjust judge, or it's been called the persistent widow. It depends who you want to focus on in the parable. It's page 76, just slightly ahead in Luke chapter 18, from verses one to eight. So what happens when God delays in answering our prayers? What should be our response? We've come like this man to his friend. We've prayed boldly, we've asked once, Sometimes God answers, sometimes he doesn't. And the context of this passage is a context about Christ's second coming. What do we do as God's people? As we see violence in the world, as we see persecution, as we live between these two comings. And it seems like the God of justice is not acting. Luke 18. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen. Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. When the justice, justice comes, it will be sudden. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is a challenging parable as we Think about brothers and sisters that are persecuted around the world, some who, who will stand firm and, and yet be beheaded for their faith. And we say, Lord, how long, how long, O oh Lord, is a cry from the Old Testament. And the purpose of this parable is given to us up front. It's as though somebody's left the, 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 the sign on the front gate as to what this parable's about. We don't have to guess on this one. Jesus put it there right up front. It's given to us that we should always pray and not give up. So let's look at the judge. Who was he in verse two? There was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. He didn't honor God. He didn't feel any shame in how he treated people. This poor widow had no effect on him. He didn't care about justice. He didn't care about her. He probably wanted bribes. She's a poor widow. She can't even offer bribes. She sees other people getting their cases heard. Why? Because they're entitled, they're wealthy, they're privileged, they're rich, which is what happens with wealthy and privileged people. They can get ahead when people who are in poverty and are previously disadvantaged can't. No wonder he's called the unjust judge in verse six. And when God doesn't answer our prayers immediately, we can also have hard thoughts about him. God, do you care? Are you a God of justice? This doesn't seem fair, how long, O oh Lord? Do you care about me? Do you care about the world? Do you care about my family? So we've looked at the judge, let's look at the widow, verse three. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. Widows were defenseless in a culture dominated by men. 
And think, widows could be young. People got married in their early teens and, and death was common. Life expectancy wasn't long. So the Bible has so much to say about widows and true religion which cares for orphans and widows. So, so this could have even been a younger lady. Without a husband, a widow was destitute. No policies, no charities of the day, nothing. And if she remained in her late husband's family, she was kind of seen as an afterthought. Oh, well, you've stayed in the family, go there in the corner and be servile. And she was just kind of pushed to one side. And if she decided to leave her late husband's family and go back to her own family, then she had to pay back the bride price. All the money that had been exchanged at the wedding, she had to pay it back. Widows were sometimes even sold as slaves, as I was reading, just to survive. And so the fact that this woman is coming to a judge in a man's world with no one to plead her case means that there was not even a male figure in her life who could plead because she as a woman shouldn't have even been in that context, which means she has no cousin, no uncle, no nephew, no male figure who can plead on her behalf. And somebody is abusing her and exploiting her in some way. We don't know what or how. So how is she going to be heard with no one to plead her cause, no mediator, no money to bribe the judge? Well, the text tells us that her need was so desperate that she keeps coming. She persists. I like to think that if she lived today, she would have stalked that judge on Facebook. She would have sent him private messages. She would have gone on Google till she tracked down his number. She would have created WhatsApp groups and she would have been WhatsApping him and phoning him and she would have found out where his holiday home is and gone there. She would have caught him at the shops. She would have stood outside the courtroom every time, grant me justice against my adversary. And we read that for some time, for some time he refused. So we've looked at the judge, we've looked at the widow. Let's look at the answer. Verse four, finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, this widow keeps bothering me, I'll see that she gets justice, she's gonna wear me out with her coming. And I find it so ironic how aware he was of his true situation. He says to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, and that can be true of us. We can know our true spiritual state and sit here this morning and be cared to do nothing about it. You say, I know I'm far from God. I know I'm not a prayer warrior. I know that I'm not even a Christian. I know I'm just dragged along by my mom or by my husband or whoever. You, you like this man, you, you're so honest, but you, 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 you don't have any care to do anything about it. And he still only cares about himself. So what was it? It was the widow's persistence that was the breakthrough. He granted her justice because she was wearing him out. Do you know what the word in the Greek means for wearing you out? It means to punch somebody beneath the eye. That's literally what it means. She was punching him black and blue beneath the eye. Grant me justice. Grant me, grant me, grant me, grant me. And he, he'd had enough. He says, enough. I, I'm being beaten black and blue. She's giving me a headache. She's driving me insane. I'm going mad. She's like a pit bull. She just won't let go. It doesn't matter where I turn. I can't even go to the toilet and she's somewhere in the back. Uh, she's everywhere. Let me grant her what she wants so I can get rid of her. So we've looked at the judge, we've looked at the widow, we've looked at the answer, now let's look at the punchline. Verse six. <laughs> and the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones that cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So friends, this is also a parable of contrast. And I don't know, it, it, it speaks to me because when I'm told just to pray, it doesn't always grip my heart, but when I, I, I look at these contrasts and I say, if ordinary people, if sinful people, if even, even p evil people can respond to prayer, then Justin, how much more? How much more? Adam Clark, an old commentator, says, if such an infamous character as this judge could yield to the pressing and continual solicitations of a poor widow for whom he felt nothing but contempt, how much more ready must God be who's infinitely good and merciful and who loves his creatures in the tenderest manner? It's a parable of contrast. You're not meant to pester God because he's trying to get rid of you. It's the complete opposite. He wants you to come. He wants fellowship. He wants to enjoy your presence as much as you want to enjoy his. And the Lord will come again, the context says, and will eventually right every wrong. But the sting in the tail of this parable, right at the end, is when he returns, will he find you faithful in prayer? 
Peter tells us that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day, and the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. God wants to know, when I come again, will you still be praying? Will you have given up? Will I find faith on the earth? Where will be the faithful prayers? Your prayer life is the only way that you have to know that you still have faith in God and not just faith in yourself and your own smarts. How easily we give up. You see, the danger here, the sting in the tail is not with God being unfaithful. That's what we say. God's gonna be unfaithful in answering my prayer. And Jesus turns it around and says, no, you might be unfaithful in prayer. The widow had faith that she would be answered and she persisted. And what of us? So brothers and sisters, we have two parables we've looked at. They expose two hindrances to prayer. And here's a summary of them. Number one, the friend at midnight exposes our self-sufficiency in not coming. Because we've got bread, we, we, we don't need to go, and I'm ashamed and all the rest. And number two, the, the parable of the unjust judge or the persistent widow exposes our lack of perseverance in not coming. So having asked once and got a, 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 a maybe, we don't persist. The friend at midnight is about thinking that God won't be bothered with my needs, so I won't pray. The unjust judge is, is about thinking that God hasn't yet answered my prayer, so I won't pr- keep praying. But the friend at midnight is a call. It's a call to come and pray prayers that are bold and shameless and risk-taking. And the unjust judge parable is a call to keep crying out for justice until justice comes. So I think these two parables summarize beautifully what Jesus taught in Luke chapter 11. Just after the parable of the friend at midnight, and I'll put the text up on the screen so you don't need to turn there. Luke chapter 11 and verse 9. These parables summarize this, I believe. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. And so we're really left with three questions this morning. Number one, ask. Ask, do you recognize your need? That's where this starts. Ask, seek, knock. There's a growing intensity, but the asking is something quite simple. Do you just, in humility, recognize your need? Your inadequacy to meet your own needs. It's hard for us to ask for directions. It's hard for us to ask for help. And sometimes I think, why? Why? My own heart is. Maybe that's because I'm always in pastor mode or counseling mode, so I I always have have to help other people. And sometimes I think, no, I need help. But you knew that. <laughs> so did my wife. Uh, but I, I, I think when I first started in ministry, I mean, this is a, a humorous story, but I didn't have any transport. So somebody in the church loaned me uh, for about six months their old VW Beetle. And so I wanted to be a good steward of the property that had been entrusted to me. And I, in Cape Town, I'd had this old mini that the brakes would fail and, you know, and I'd always have to check the radiator. So one day I thought, well, you know, I need to just like check the radiator and all the rest. So I went to the bonnet and I opened it and there was no engine in the Beetle. <laughs> so that was the first thing. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have to phone my friend. And so I don't know what I've done. I don't even know how this car is running, but there's no engine. And then I walked around the back and I realized, oh, the engine is in here. Well, step two, where is the radiator? And so I'm looking for the radio and I'm thinking, I must make the mistake that I did when I first got my driver's license and I poured water into the oil of my dad's car and then I had to empty the oil out. It was a long thing and I got badly disciplined for that. And, uh, so I'm looking for the radiator. Where is it? And I can't find it. Eventually I have to humble myself and phone my friend and say, where's the radiator? And he laughed for the next five minutes. And you, you don't even know why he laughed because you're in my boat because you weren't born around 1960. He says, VW Beetles are air-cooled. There is no radiator. It's like, oh, Great. But asking implies humility. The friend without bread had nothing to offer his guest. And how many times have the needs of others weighed heavily on us? And we don't have answers for them. I mean, I think of of, of Rose over there and and what she's going through. What, What human answers do we have for Rose in this season? What answers do we have for those that are, that are grieving in our midst or being unemployed or just having a tough time? What answers? But the needs of others sometimes weigh heavily on us that, that all we can do is be driven to pray, which is like this friend at midnight, and then to say, well, Lord, what have you given me that I can pass on to others? Because, Lord, anything I have, either that I've prayed for or I've been blessed with, is from your supply. I didn't, I didn't muster this up in my own self-reliance. And what about the widow? She is helpless. She couldn't bribe God. She can't coerce him. 
No one to plead her cause, but we have a mediator. We have one called Christ who stands in the gap, who's in heaven right now interceding and saying, Father, listen to his prayer. I know he's a sinner. I know he's got no merit, but remember he's covered in my blood. He's clothed in my righteousness. And we have the Holy Spirit when we say, Lord, I don't even know what to pray. There's just this burden in my heart. And the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. We have support. We are not just one widow alone. We're a church family gathered together and we can pray. And a God who loves to commune with us and pray. Let us pray and not give up. So ask, do you recognize your need? And then number two, seek. Do you recognize who can meet your need? So one thing to mope around and say, I've got these needs. But once you've seen Christ, he's like the pearl of great price. Are you seeking him? Are you pursuing him like a merchant who says, I'll sell everything to get this precious pearl. Uh, Lord, I want you. Lord, I need you. Then seek him. Run to your heavenly Father in your time, regardless of the time of day or the hour or the season, regardless of what anyone else thinks of you. Seeking is asking plus action. Go to the home of your willing friend and ask for bread. Go to the home of the unjust judge and plead because he's not unjust. The one that we pray to is infinitely just and holy and merciful no matter how long, no matter how late. And then thirdly, knock. Ask, seek, and knock. Do you recognize the bold, risk-taking step of faith required? You can have recognized your need, you can have sought out the answer, and you can stand there and still not knock. There's something about a step of faith that's saying, I'm gonna knock now. and I'm gonna take a risk and I'm gonna see if the door opens, I'm gonna see if there's a response. It's a step of faith. And our temptation is to see God as an annoyed friend who's bothered, to see God as an unjust judge who won't be moved. And Jesus again says to us, if even sinful, evil people will respond, then how much more God who is altogether good and wise. Are you getting it? So knock with a shameless, persevering faith. Call out, keep coming, don't give up. Even when the door seems locked, and recognize that what you need is inside. Stand there knocking as though you are a a, a weary traveler out in the cold, there's a blizzard blowing and you know inside is warmth and you say, Lord, let me in. Give me your blessing. And sometimes the answer is immediate and you ask once and God responds and other times God says no. This isn't a sermon about when God says no, we haven't even unpacked it. Sometimes God says yes after once and sometimes God says wait. Keep knocking Keep seeking, keep asking. So let me close with these words from Thomas Watson. He's an old Puritan pastor, and he once asked the question, why does God delay in answering prayer? So in other words, assuming God's answer to us has not been no, sometimes we, we don't like the no's, and so we think it's a wait, but the no's are no, but let's, let's assume that's not the case. Why would God ever call us to keep asking and keep seeking and keep knocking? Thomas Watson gives us four answers and let me paraphrase them briefly and they'll be up on the screen. Number one, God delays in answering prayer because he loves to hear the voice of prayer. Watson says, you let the musician play a great while before you throw him down money because you love to hear his music and God loves to hear the music of prayer and maybe he's enjoying that music and the answer is still to come. Number two, that God may humble us. We may too easily assume that we merit some ready answer or that God is at our beck and call like a butler, not as a sovereign Lord and loving Father. And in waiting, we are humbled. Number three, because God sees we are not yet fit or ready for the mercy we seek. That's why he delays it. Sometimes God says no. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said, if God had answered all the silly prayers I'd prayed, where would I be now? Sometimes it's a mercy and a grace. God says no. But sometimes God says wait because we're not ready for what we've asked for. Watson says it may be that he has things to put in place. In us or in our church or in the world, there are a million pieces to the puzzle. Some things go first to make a place for the others. And then fourthly, Watson says, God delays prayer that the mercy we pray for may be the more prized and may be sweeter when it comes. Sometimes praying refines even our motives and God says, do you really want that? Is that really a true need? Well, then you'll keep persevering in prayer and our motives become refined so we tend to persevere in things that we really believe are God's will and right for us and when those things come, they are the more prized because we've waited for them. 
with the cracks in the tail as I close, is Jesus' words to us. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we're in need in so many ways of your Spirit's help in terms of our prayers. Lord, we know how stubborn we can be, how self-reliant we can be. We can think it's about our smarts and our capabilities. Lord, every now and again we suffer or we face situations beyond our control and then we recognize again, oh yes, all I have is the illusion of control. You are truly in charge. And Lord, I just thank you that you long to have a relationship with us. You, the king of the universe, have made a way for us to come and not just come timidly, but to come boldly with confidence. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you died on the cross, that you tore that curtain in the temple in two, that you said we have access to the Father. You have reconciled us to God. There is, there is no shame. There, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would avail ourselves of the privilege of prayer, that we would persevere in prayer, that we'd recognize, Lord, that far too often we are like poor paupers walking around when when what's offered to us is this great banquet at your throne of grace. And Lord, we just ask that you would provide us with all of our spiritual needs, that the bread, Lord, you are the bread of life. Won't you enable us to feast upon you, to find nourishment? That, Lord, we take that nourishment out into the world, that others would come to discover that you are the bread of life who meets every true need and gives us every spiritual blessing in Christ. Oh, Lord, may we come boldly and may we come perseveringly because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.